Hello? Hi. Uh, hello? Hi. Can you hear me? Hey, Jacob. Uh, hello? Sorry, let me do a quick mic test. Yeah, it says everything's working. Hello? Yes, I, I hear your voice. Oh, there we are. Hey guys, sorry about that. I need to turn the speakers on. Uh, okay, sorry about that. Jacob, hey everyone, how's it going? How's going good? Yeah. Hey, Peter. Okay. Hi, hey, Jacob. Awesome. We have a lot of people tonight. Around? I think there were like 30 people who are SVP'd. I know. I'm a little bit nervous now. I'm really nervous, actually. Okay. So, um, should we do like what we normally do? Um, we do like the first. Jacob, you have a better memory for this than I do. Is it the 10 minutes or 15 minutes that we just do kind of hang out first introductions and then uh, go around and just kind of talking and hanging out for uh, 10 to 15 minutes? Yeah, I'm, I'm not too much of an overly structured person, but yeah, approximately that I think is how it usually ends up going up down. Okay, cool. Yeah, you had some really good ideas though when we first set everything out, and I wish we wrote it down almost as like bylaws or something because uh, they were really good, but they were those things that are easy to forget a little bit. So, okay, um, oh, man, I wish I could do auto admit. It's making me admit everyone. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So uh, you, if you go in, I think if you go in securities and you and you take away the waiting room, it will be auto admit. Ah, uh, cool. Okay, I just undo that. Disable waiting room. Okay, and it's auto admit. Sweet. Hey, thank you so much. Awesome. So now, do you guys see what I see on the right side where it says participants 11 and then Keith Klein joining? Mm. Don't think so. No, okay. I mean, I see participants. But... It is because I'm the host, but for some reason, since I, I basically changed it as he was in the waiting room. Uh, so I think for some reason, it's not letting him in. Mm. Anyway, okay. I'm sorry. Minor technical difficulties. Um, yeah, how about, should we just go around and do, do intros? Sure. Maybe where we're working out, what we're working on, uh, or... If we're not working in closure for our jobs, maybe uh, either side projects or what we'd like to be or hope to be working on. Uh, and where are you right now? And where are you? Yes. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. So I'll start it off. Um, I'm Brian Abbott. Um, Brian. I, I am currently in, um, not in Provo, Utah. I am in Linden, Utah. And I work at a company called Taxbit. Uh, we are a full closure shop operation, um, and yeah, I do uh, I do basically tax bit uh, or tax compliance for cryptocurrencies in closure. It's tons of fun, and we are uh, looking to ramp up throughout the year. So uh, you guys should send me your resume if you're interested, or just send it to me anyway. Smart. So, yeah. Wait, I'll go next. Um, I'm Jacob. I'm not getting money for doing closure, but I am doing it full time. I'm a startup founder, um, pre funding doing findca.com, which is a recommender system. Um, I was in Provo, Utah until a couple months ago, and now I'm in Washington, about an hour north of Seattle. Awesome. So.
Anish. Hi, uh, hi everyone. I'm Anish. I am from Melbourne. Uh, I live in Melbourne. Uh, I don't use Clojure. Unfortunately, I don't use Clojure at work. We use Python. I am pushing for Clojure, but again, uh, I work for um, uh, I work for energy company, and we are into renewables. Uh, but I use Clojure in my free time, especially my side projects. And one of the side projects that I used to work on, like probably six months back, that I used to work on an app uh, just to, for myself. And I was using like Clojure Script and Clojure uh, GraphQL on the back end. It was fun and I love it. And I get into the Clojure land is because I used to use JavaScript and ES6 in particular. But I had a lot of trouble with, uh, especially with all ES6 systems, like uh, JavaScript systems. So then one day, I and one of my friend, he's been using Clojure since like eight years, since inception. And he was pushing me for Clojure. And then after struggling a lot with ES6, then I converted totally into Clojure. Very cool, nice. Hey, so um, that's interesting what you said about trying to push closure for your team and um, you know the adoption by your company. One of our goals as a meetup group is to f help facilitate uh, the pairing of um, closureists to IT organizations or develop software organizations that want to um, take on closure as a as a primary language but uh are afraid for the obvious reasons of trying to find talent in closure so that's that's our stated objective at the same time you know part of that a, a secondary component of that objective is like helping organizations identifying organizations fears and concerns in aside from the, the talent, the tech talent, acquiring that, um, or training tech talent. So aside from that, you know, it'd be really interesting just to kind of um, keep tabs with you on kind of their concerns as you go along with them and, and helping to alleviate that. Yeah, that would be awesome, thanks. Yeah, cool. I feel like that's, you know, in any language, especially for us as programmers who are highly technical, it's like, we want to be able to take on interesting technical challenges. And there's always an element of liability from the CTO perspective, you know? So it's like, um, I mean, that's what a community is all about is power through numbers and then, and, and helping to overcome that. And anything that we do do find that we find we'll publish it and, and hopefully make it available to everybody. So yeah, cool. Thank you. Yeah. Awesome. Um, so I'll just, I'll drive the intro since I think the list of names is different for everybody. So I'll just go from uh, left uh, actually, right. Brian, I'll go real quick. Okay, right I on. I got something in the oven and I gotta, I'm kind awesome. of lost in it. Uh, hey, I'm Peter. Uh, I'm, I'm here in San Francisco, even though my background is Tahoe. Um, I'm a product guy. Um, I was in the accounting space. Um, maybe you've heard of Xero. Uh, but, and I'm not a programmer, but I'm learning your script. Um, which I'm finding very, very fun to learn. I love the functional programming because I, I call it, you know, I'm very familiar with Excel and I, I, I just consider it like nested cells that you can point to each other. So it's a very rudimentary way of viewing it, but, um, you know, I love coding and closure, but I'm, I'm very uh, wet behind the ears. So I got a lot to learn. So nice meeting y'all. Oh, and I'm, uh, I'm doing a startup myself. It's a tax startup. Um, so it's going to be kind of helping corporate taxes be filed. Interesting. That's really interesting, Peter. Um, yeah, we work in sort of a shared space. Yeah, we should, uh, yeah, we should keep in touch. Cool. Yes, definitely. Right on. Uh, so Kenny, I think it shows you next up. Sure. So I write closure for a company called Tract Manager. It's in the healthcare space. I've been using closure for about five years now and I am located in Chattanooga, Tennessee. Awesome, right on, welcome. Thank you for joining us. Heather, are you available? Yes, I am. Awesome. Um, I am in Oakland, California, and um, I work for Maven, um, 
M-A-Y-V-E-N-N. It's an e-commerce um, site that sells hair for our weaves and extensions. And we use Clojure in pretty much everything. Um, and I'm trying to think what else to say. Um, I joined tonight um, because about half of our engineering team this year was following uh, the MIT's programming with categories. Um, oh, cool course earlier this year we'd get together every Friday and watch them together and then like that kind of fell apart after you know shelter in place and stuff and so I thought I would come and report back to everyone because a lot of them were interested in watching this tonight but Friday night you know it was a busy night so yes okay um yes absolutely um excellent welcome I'm really glad to have you then and and to hear that you came for category theory specifically so I'll just write down these names since uh, Olaf, are you are you here? Yeah, sure. Uh, hi, uh, thanks for having me. I'm joining from Zurich. I work uh, similar to Anish in the renewable sector. I use a lot of Python, and uh, but some time ago, maybe even a year ago, I was looking for for a new step and. Um, because I work a lot with uh, distributed systems, I, I came to the conclusion that functional might be a, a very good fit for a context like that. And uh, I mean, at the end, I just came to closure. And uh, since a few months, I'm actively studying. But uh, unfortunately, I, I, I wasn't able so far to bring it uh, in, in into the company, but maybe I might be able to sneak it in soon. <laughs> awesome. Have you talked to your other colleagues about it? Um, I, I, we use uh, Metaspace uh, for for uh, for data analytics. That's what I presented to the to the business BI analysts, and uh, I don't even know that they probably don't even know that Clojure is running and and. and for most part, I, I I think more the the from the business side, like you said, very often the results count, and it's it's more for me from a technical side that I see closer closure as a very good fit. Absolutely, right on. Cool, uh, Luis Rosso. Yes, yes. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. Good good evening. Uh, well, I'm I'm Luis from Argentina. Uh, I'm a um, uh, developer, architect, and so on. My, my experience is in, mainly in backend in Java and Kotlin. And uh, as a second, uh, skills are JavaScript and TypeScript. But I have been a fan of Clojure. I don't have any job experience in Clojure, but I have been studying uh, for the last five, uh, 10 years, perhaps uh, at the very beginning of Clojure. I'm very fond of, uh, of functional programming and uh, the uh, meta programming, uh, all, all the Lisp dialects, a uh, racket and scheme and so on. And uh, for the five, last four or five years, I have been studying uh, in my spare time, uh, Haskell and, uh, and mainly Haskell. And uh, I'm very fond of the category theory. theory. I don't. Uh, I am trying to to get my hands dirty with category, category theory because I get the, the the jump from theory to practice is quite quite difficult. So, but I I differentiate a closure from Haskell. I I have the uh, perhaps the, the assumption perhaps wrong that a, a category theory it, a, is a bound to type a, to type systems uh, i didn't i didn't uh, under, uh, assume that uh, it could be implemented in a dynamic language such as a closure and a lisp dialects uh, uh, nevertheless i i in my in the radar i found out about a, a category theory project in, in implemented on closure, but I haven't had a chance to 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 take in a look, a thorough look about it, and uh, uh, I have the chance to to congratulate to uh, to Jacob because I, I I perhaps two months ago I detected the the beef project. Uh, it was it is 
very interesting. I haven't uh, taken the chance to, to get my hands dirty with it, but it's, it seems very promising. I, I will surely uh, uh, experiment, experiment with it in the, in the short term. Glad to hear it. Yeah, and if, if anyone else is interested in BIF, it, so it's a web framework I've been working on. Um, so the Closure Mid-Cities Meetup on Monday invited me to give the next presentation. So on Monday, I'm going to be giving a presentation about BIF there. Awesome. It, it, it seems uh, very great. Thank you. Are you going to do that in person, Jacob, or uh, virtually? Uh, virtually, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it's in Texas, and I'm here in Washington. Oh, OK. <laughs> right. When you said mid-cities, I was like, maybe that's a, I figured maybe it was Seattle, but no. <laughs> OK, cool. Okay, great to, great to meet you, uh, Luis. So um, both you and Heather then are here specifically for category theory. Yes, yes. Okay, great. That's good to know. Um, and then let's see, uh, Paul? Are you here with a uh, microphone and, and camera? Looks like he might not be. Uh, Rafa? Yeah. Uh, hey, so I'm in West Valley, Utah, and I'm just learning, I guess. Yeah. Okay. You're learning closure? Yeah, yeah. Just started playing around with it. Do you do, um, are you a programmer either by trade or by hobby in other languages prior to this? Uh, JavaScript. That's probably like what I'm better at, but I thought I'd try closure for a bit. Okay, cool. Are you primarily a web guy then, like web front end? Yeah. Okay. Hey, cool. Yeah. Well, welcome. That's awesome. Um, yeah. yeah, we're definitely excited to have, have guys who are looking to uh, do cross-discipline type uh, stuff. So, okay, cool. And then, um, yeah, I mean, so then we try to just have a casual, I guess we're at 18 minutes in, but um, we just try to have a kind of a casual after we introduce ourselves, just a casual five to 10 minute conversation on, um, you know, so what we've been looking at, what we're into, and maybe and or what we're excited about um, to be getting into in the future. So we can cut that short if no one's, you know. Yeah, I, I, I think maybe, maybe we just go into the discussion on category theory because we talked a little bit okay. about stuff. Yeah, let's do that. Already. All right, cool. Sounds good. Um, Okay, so I'll go ahead and share my screen. I'm a little bit, I have to say, I don't have a background in, I don't have a strong background in traditional or um, graduate level mathematics in, in any way. So uh, this is not my normal forte, but um, I've been getting into it more and more. Okay, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Actually, I don't know if that's what I want to do. I could just share the, but okay, here, I'll just go, I'll go forward with this. Um, so yeah, so I'm a little out of my own, but I think we'll do fine. Um, so I just want to say at the outset, uh, the idea, oh, sorry, play from the start, there we go. So my idea with this, with the category theory thing was like, you know, the way I came to functional programming is a little bit different, I think, than um, a lot of people. I was researching some kind of, basically a project that would do uh, something called knowledge-oriented programming, where you could basically, and what's needed to really, to uh, manifest that, if you will, or bring that into a, um, a working kind of state, was to be able to have uh, mixed disciplines of code, being able to kind of work with each other in a sort of dynamic state, if you will, or dynamically. And so the idea was essentially, can you, is there, is there essentially an algebra or a mathematic to have a formal theory of having essentially a directed graph of code that is partially generated and partially deliberately programmed and then partially developed from this idea of an intense ontology. And so it was, it's, it's kind of a multi-paradigm, um, multi-runtime, but, but totally integrated kind of a platform. 
And it was like, what kind of, you know, formal system exists to do dynamic parametric binding such that you can be calling different kinds of code, um, uh, you know, one from a static ontological definition, which is the knowledge, the uh, uh, knowledge dashboard, if you will, um, which is, it's a, a workspace for developing ontologies, but then how to actually call ontological code that then calls into web services code, et cetera, et cetera, and is able to map its parameters kind of seamlessly through any foundation. And Lambda Calculus is very much um, an attractive paradigm for that. And so I got into functional programming with that. And then also just looking at like C Sharp with, the, with Link in the 2000s of like in expression trees and the idea of data as code and then how to do that in an imperative programming paradigm uh, was very interesting. But when I first got into functional programming, I wasn't reading about Haskell or the languages, but I had read somewhere, and I wish I could find this reference, that category theory was a core foundational uh, element that was kind of, that was very much applicable to any um, functional uh, programming language. And so I feel like as functional, uh, functional programmers, we sometimes often take that too heavily to mean uh, Haskell. And I don't think or know that it does. And I'm more and more pleased to find out that the, the framework I picked for doing category theory and closure called Fluo Kitten uh, is very much, it's, um, you know, as, as um, oh, I'm sorry, I forget your name now. Uh, the gentleman from Brazil, um, I'm sorry. Um, as he was talking, you know, it's, it very much occurred to me that, um, Haskell provides the same syntactic sugar for category theory that C++ does for object-oriented programming. So you can very much do category theory in any programming language, and it's very natural to do it in any programming language, and you will get the benefits in any language. Um, but, but Haskell, I think we attribute it to because it is the one and only language that uh, elevates it or gives it a special place in its syntax. Um, so that was just kind of one, one thought about our, our introduction. And then the other thing is, so this is kind of, this meetup tonight is sort of experimental in the sense that, um, so one part of the Closure Provo Group's um, sort of idea or pursuit is to do functional programming core disciplines or functional programming discipline uh, foundation, if you will. And so that's like set theory, lambda calculus, um, type theory, category theory, recursive function theory, all these like kind of things that uh, led up to, you know, and it's with the idea of if we know why, uh, you know, what what is this beauty that exists mathematically such that you know, we see it in our code, but we don't always have the attributions to the mathematical foundation. That is the motivation for category theory in closure uh, as kind of a side series of our primary closure presentations. And that's why I was asking earlier, um, you know, who is motivated here to be here specifically for category theory? Because this is very much a kind of temperature taking presentation of do we have enough of a population that's, that's generally motivated uh, to both attend presentations and perhaps hopefully give presentations on doing categorical programming in closure, um, either in cats, fun calls, cats, um, dragons, flu kitten, and or perhaps a framework that maybe we identify as being a little bit more congruent with the ideas of category theory. Um, that we, you know, that we might find on our own. So um, with that, I'll just go ahead and get started. And yeah, feel free to chime in and ask questions. Um, so again, as sort of a initial barometer, this is a short presentation. I'm really sorry about that. I didn't have as much time uh, to develop this as I wanted to, but with that, we'll get started. Um, so this is our first one, installment one. And the idea is for it to meant to be a quick overview. Um, Oh, there we go. I just click. So um, it's kind of important, and I'm not going to read this, but I just these are these are definitions. So, you know, what is category theory? And we essentially have two definitions that exist out there. One is the functional programming category theory, 
and the other is the mathematical category theory and trying to want to communicate both and then and then understand why we sourced it in mathematics and and how and the reason that we have the rendition in functional programming that we do and so you know really you can think of it as an abstraction of abstractions and it's uh, essentially becomes an assembly language for mathematics. You can describe anything mathematically, calculus, um, you know, whatever, graph theory, uh, game theory. I just read actually a couple papers on game theory, uh, doing it categorically, as well as doing um, the mathematics behind natural language pr uh, processing categorically. So there's a couple um, uh, researchers out there using category theory for things like that. And then even basic uh, numerical operations or um, uh, what's it called in, in elementary school? Arithmetic, basic arithmetic operations can be described categorically. Um, and then, so the main ideas of course are we have a set of objects, which are nodes, and then a set of morphisms, which are essentially um, it's an arrow, we draw it as an arrow, but it's, an, it's representat representative of an operation between two uh, objects to introduce a state transition while maintaining um, type awareness on the input and output uh, sides of the equation. Um, also, as an aside, just, um, so Dragon is willing to also come to this and, and present and, and talk to us. He's actually going to come to this one and do the flu kitten presentation, um, but he's in Serbia. So if we were to do it, we'd have to do it a little bit earlier. Um, so it's something to keep in mind. Um, why category theory? So as yeah, okay, yeah. Um, so category theory is you know it allows us to uh, essentially by having that dynamic, that most higher level abstraction that has some very simple operations, um, we can essentially keep things maintained in such a way that we can do function composition. So this is sort of why category theory in functional programming. And by, by applying category theory to our type modeling, um, it enables the sort of higher order um, desired destination uh, as far as a, a place to want to reside is uh, in in that of being able to do dynamic function composition. So, and that's all to do with the input typing and the output typing association. So I'm sorry, this slide is, um, yeah, this is gonna happen a little bit, I'm sorry. This is very much a prototype presentation. So um, I felt, you know, always like kind of getting into stuff. It's great, I think, to know the history because the history also tells you why tells you why, like what was the motivation for an action. And then the action tells us essentially how we got from play from to, right? It's, it's an edge as well. Like the history is very much an edge function or a morphism of like from and to. It's even like when we complain about programming languages, right? It's like we're looking at it at our current time, not in the moment when it was created, you know? And so it's like, like C++ or something like that. If we look at, if we go back to 1981, suddenly it looks like the best thing out there, you know? Um, so this is kind of that. This is an attempt to establish a set of resources that we can go back to um, and, and find, you know, first sort of, now this is uh, prehistory because this is 1890 to 1945. And so that was like, um, David Hilbert was, as far as I know, like he was very much investigating like Cantor's kinds of uh, the thesis and the ideas that Cantor had had manifested around set theory and its applicability to uh, describing essentially greater mathematics as a whole. Um, and so that was kind of the the initial impetus. Um, and then, you know, and going from there, being building these constructs and then experimentally demonstrating, you know, how they are able to achieve these kinds of uh, explanations and descriptions in a very generic way of very complicated mathematical operations. So it's really, 
up till 1945, these ideas were very much condensating. Um, and then, and then actually we have one, one precursor is in here in 1942 with um, Eilenberg and McLean. So this is kind of considered a precursor, but not the precursor to, to category theory. And then we really have this. This is like the moment of genesis, right? This is the earth has been created, life can exist, category theory uh, is invented. And so in 1945, Saunders, McLean, and Samuel Eilenberg, um, and this is where they really uh, define their axioms for the very basic uh, foundational elements of category theory. And then I kind of just to give some kind of, you know, so in tracking a, the, uh, the explosion, if you will, or the footprint, the adoption of any scientific discipline, one, one telltale sign is like the amount of research um, that, that starts kind of snowballing, and then the reference count, essentially the edge count on these on papers that gather in time. You can almost think of it as like it's cementing a foundation. You know, it, it's uh, like in machine learning, it's, it's, uh, it's increasing your confidence interval. It's not a false paper, right? So these are all highly referenced papers, and you can see that, you know, 1945, there was a couple things sheaf theory and then uh, and then category theory simultaneously. That's the other thing. I meant to put in here the, the synonyms for category theory. There's a lot of them, right? Topos theory, topoi theory, uh, algebraic topology, um, and then sheaf theory. I've not specifically studied sheaf theory directly, so I don't know the degree of its, uh, how closeness the correlations are but it is highly referenced in the category theory literature. Um, and then we get down to Grottendieck um, and the work that he did. Um, and I think it's really the 60s and then the 80s, but he started out clearly in the late 50s. And so, yeah, so these papers are all in, um, we have the, in the functional disciplines um, resource on the Closure Provo um, GitHub. Um, organization. These are all checked into a, a repository and you can uh, check it out if you want and download it. And, and by all means, please uh, submit pull requests if you find anything else. That would be totally awesome. Um, so this is a little more. And then down here, it's kind of like, yeah, here's, uh, this is the idea, you know, very much these are, these are foundational papers in category theory, especially Grottendieck, although I've not read him as much. Um, but a full list is available here on uh, Wikipedia. And then all those are available in our, our GitHub account. And so kind of the basic, the most basic elements, of course, are categories, morphisms, functors, and monads. And so a category, um, I will not read this. I'll just give a quick overview. Um, you know, it's essentially, as we talked about before, it's, it's, you can ultimately look at it as a direct graph, but we don't really talk about it that way too often in category theory. But it is a set of nodes of, that are either functions or sets or perhaps values, it can really be anything, um, that are then bound together in a set of um, transformational operations that we call morphisms or these arrows. Um, and yeah, this is a general morphism. But this is also, this is so key because this is what's allowing for uh, function composition. I mean, this is why we study it in, um, or, or seek to have our code behave this way in functional programming is by maintaining this, um, what's the right word? Sort of a, a congruency between input and output and having a set of rules about the, the type associations and, and the kindedness um, we can get to the higher level function composition as they're identifying right here. And then that can also be dynamic. So when we look at um, higher order functions like uh, what map takes or um, all the seek operations in closure, um, that's a kind of a thing of being able to do this, right? Um, and so a functor is, I'm sorry for not having the, the full diagram. A functor is just, it's, um, essentially, it's an operation that has type associated, it's essentially a function. It's performing a mapping of an element of set A to set B, where the type, uh, 
information is contained within the functor itself. So it's it's like, you know, um, I mean, the category is really this, the object and the functor is the function that is operating on the object to produce a process result. Um, and then monads, I'm sorry, also this is, um, this is this, so monads basically are doing in the functional programming uh, view of, of category theory are doing type lifting, right? So if an operation results in a set of nested types, the monad, a monad mapping in the place essentially as a superset onto a functor is hoisting, is performing uh, what we call type hoisting, right? Um, which essentially takes it out of any casing or shaping and re-returns us to that raw type such that now we can, re we can use these generative operations in our original functors again. So it's, it's giving us this generic paradigm for doing associated operations. Okay, and now, and this is kind of the meat of, so this is I, uh, Dragon, uh, I don't know if we know him here as a group, um, but he is, he's a great closurist. Um, I saw him speak at Conj, excuse me, in November, and uh, he's really great. He does, um, he has a couple books doing machine learning in Clojure, and the thing is about his books, um, everything that he did for the books are, he also wrote the code um, to drive the actual machine learning operations, so it's, um, so he wrote Neanderthal, which is a GPU numerical processing library, essentially implementing the, I think actually he's linking to BLAS and LAPAC, um, the linear algebra package. And I forget what BLAS stands for. If anyone knows, maybe um, chime in. But um, I think maybe it is linear algebra, I forget what it stands for. It's a set of numerical operations. Both were originally written in Fortran, um, and they're kind of the standard for, for doing linear algebra computationally. I think they're still today even, even though they were written in the 60s and 70s, they're the fastest libraries we have. Um, but so Neanderthal, when I got a hold of Dragon, um, he mentioned that to really talk about Fluokitten, uh, the best place to use it, and the reason he actually wrote it, the reason he wrote Fluokitten, was to be able to perform operations in uh, Neanderthal using the category, the basically the alignment that's that's created through category theory to maintain a set of rules and relationships such that his operations became a little bit more mechanical in that regard. And he could rely on, on on that structure, kind of always producing the same results. Um, so so yeah. So and and again, like we said, uh, he's the author of Neanderthal, Flow Kitten. If you go to Uncomplicate, you'll see all of his stuff, and his two books, which are really good. I would really recommend uh, if you have any interest in doing numerical computation in closure, or even just in general. Um, his books are, I think, really cheap. They were like either ten or eighteen dollars, and he does continuous updates. Also, is the neat thing. Anytime something new comes out, um, if you subscribe to his Patreon account, uh, for it's a donation. So even a dollar a month, he'll he sends you the new, the new books. Um, so these were kind of the 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 core components I identified. So I'm really sorry. This is where we have to do this as kind of a group thing together. Oh, whoops, I'm sorry. Ah, because I ran out of time. And so I don't have a presentation on these as much as I would like to. And what I thought we might do is do this as kind of a reading group style where we go through it and we point out, um, uh, we identify the, the category theory operations and then uh, we can kind of do it as a discussion rather than a presentation. Um, and then I'll just finish out the presentation and then we can move over to the code. Um, so like I mentioned earlier, we have sort of this functional discipline track as part of our meetup group. And um, the one for category theory, often referenced as CATS, uh, is available here on our GitHub organizational account. 
And then you can just check out this, the, the functional discipline content cats. And that's um, all the, the resources that um, we have to date. So yeah. And again, pull requests would be super awesome. So yeah, that's, that's that part. Does anyone have any questions or thoughts or ideas so far? Oh, I don't know if, am I able to hear anyone else? Oh, Jacob, I'll make you host so that, because I don't know if I'm controlling my mic or, or any of that. So if you could, if you could take on the host role and then maybe others can, uh, I think the mics are all working. Are they? Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I hope I didn't put everyone to sleep then. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry if I did. Uh, okay. So we'll just go back and is everyone okay with this? Is this, is this an okay way to go about this? Yes. Yeah. Okay, cool. I know it's re-indexing everything. Ah, sorry. Okay, yeah, so this kind of starts from the head of his project, a uh, Neanderthal. I guess we can first take a look at Flow Kitten. Um, so it's on the Uncomplicate site. And the main thing that you have to include is core. And that has all of his operations. And actually, yeah, that would be a good thing, I think, to go through this really quick. Um, so Fluo Kitten is pretty awesome because, let's check out the documentation on it. Um, yeah, here we are. It, uh, yeah, here we are. Okay, so Fluo Kitten is cool because what it does is it takes a lot of the operators and, and functionality that we find in Haskell and it, uh, it makes it all available in Clojure. So it's no longer just Haskell that is a functional program or a, a categorically grounded programming language. Clojure now gets it too. So, um, so he's implemented basically these, these are all core. This is like the I think, no, it's this one is the Kleisley operator. Uh, let's just go to that. No, I'm wrong. How is that not the Kleisley operator? Hmm. Okay, well, he implemented, these are all of the, uh, the left association bind. Um, so these are basically Haskell's core operators for um, doing category theory type operations. Um, and these are, so the exact details of a right associative bind versus a left is to do with a, I believe an adjoint functor, um, which is kind of, if you read the McLean book, it's like category theory ultimately ends up being uh, a set of adjoint functor operations is his, is his description near the end of the book. Um, so, but of course it's very detailed. It's sometimes, yeah. Uh, so these give us all the basic uh, operations on monads and then on, I believe, functors or functions. And then he also has the protocols that then Im implement um, monads, folds, functors, um, monads, and then kind of all the core types and then they're associated. Um, so like the monoid and it has the identity operator. Um, so this is very much a, um, both an operator, a Haskell operator kind of implementation for, uh, for closure, as well as just a general category theory um, kind of object model and, and set of operations. So it gives us the best of both worlds is kind of how I look at it. Um, and then, so yeah, so, uh, sorry, this is, so if we go into his, um, back down here to Neanderthal, we essentially have, 
let's see. So in the examples, it's not Neanderthal again is a is a numerical GPU processing device. So a lot of this stuff is going to be on internal device. And then Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. It's here. There's a lot of code. Uh, it's a really great developer, actually. So yeah, Dragon Durek, he's a Serbian guy. And if anyone's interested in um, doing these meetings, sort of, it would have to be kind of midday to, to early, maybe late afternoon at the latest. He is fully down to come and uh, talk to us and talk with us and present with us. So uh, he's a really great guy. Um, yeah. So again, here are his, his references, his includes to the base flow kitten types. So, and I'll just stay with the kind of the more um, uh, the, the elementary ones. Um, so monoid. And so we can see how he's using that. Um, I believe, yeah, so he's using this to build up a sort of a type, a set of type, uh, type descriptions, type definitions, and then operative associations with them for sort of each implementation. Um, so, so he implements uh, types on, on Clojure? Yeah, exactly. I mean, he's using def type here. So I usually, I'm familiar with def protocol. So usually def protocol is um, like these must be protocols. Is that right, Jacob? Mm -hmm. No? Uh, it's okay. Uh, I, I mean, oh yeah, like, like odd. So when you uh, define a type, so yeah. a type you define first, at least the way I've always done, it, but the thing about it in Clojure's type system, it's so, um, so flexible as far as I found it to be like, you can do it more than one way. So to look at this and say he's doing it that way, I don't know. The way I normally would do it is I would define a protocol and then I would define for each instance of that protocol that I want um, t operations that are specific to that type. So it's very much like in Java defining an interface and then for your class implementations uh, you would do you do the specific um, specific operation for each class in here. And so, so this is his, so he's building some stuff up. This is a block vector then. So, and this is going to be for OpenCL. Um, so again, and flow, flow kittens is a, a, cate a category theory implementation on closure. Uh, and you mentioned cats or, uh, as well, right? Yes, cats is another one. That's absolutely another right. one. Uh, have you compared them? And you shows uh, flow kittens as you uh, regarded it uh, superior to cats. So yeah, thank you. That's a really good question. I did kind of a cursory comparison. I've not. So where I want to go with this with this kind of category theory sub uh, group or subtract, if you will, is. I don't know if you guys are familiar with Wolfram's physics project, but he's using um, like temporally associative hypergraphs to sort of re-describe all of physics, like in, from the very base operations up to the most highest level kinds of operations. And I want to go there with this. And so um, I've done some comparison to kind of say like, if we we're going to make a decision early on, um, you know, which one is best. So my main thing is like, um, there's a lot more out there on Flow Kitten. It seems to be used a lot more. So like we could just look at, I mean, the one easy thing to do, right, is where is it? The star count. So stars mm, and yes, yes. watchers. So, so let's go over and look at uh, Flow Kitten. Ah, sorry. I might be wrong. I've not done this compare. So he has less, 390 and 34. Fun cool at the same time is like, 
they are pretty kind of, they are a well-known publisher of a lot of um, closure APIs. Yes. So, I mean, yeah, exactly here. I mean, they have a ton of stuff, right? Buddy, I mean, everybody's, anyone who's done anything with the web is using Buddy. Um, yes. That's interesting though. This Is this their second most? Okay, no, that was, thank you very much. I've not done this comparison. And this, I believe these are sorted by stars. If we look at them, I think we would all agree. These are sorted by stars. So, and it's their second most starred um, library. I regret it, I used to live in Berlin and I went to the closure meetups with these guys, but I was not, so Fun Cool's out of Berlin and um, I never, I never was like that in, I wasn't that into closure at the time. Now I would be like, you know, they would probably get annoyed with me pestering them all the time. But, um, but I used to meet with them once a month and it was just kind of like, okay, yeah. Um, but no, I'll check this one out also and do a more thorough comparison. Um, and maybe if you guys are interested in having this be a more regular thing, we can talk about uh, that or, or of course, also if someone else would like to present on this and compare it to Fluo Kitten, um, that would definitely be, I think, a worthwhile thing. The thing that I liked about Fluo Kitten, the one thing that kind of caught my eye, if you will, was like anytime you bring up uh, category theory around closureists, it always goes to Haskell, you know? Like it always ends up kind of like, oh, you mean you're talking about Haskell? I was like, well, no, wait, there's a, there's a greater context and conceptualization behind it um, and, and a really great, I think a great opportunity for programming language innovation by applying it in Clojure as an equal level that is done in Haskell. And what I love about uh, Fluo Kitten is that he made these operators and the set of operations available such that um, it looks a lot more like Haskell when you, when you code it. But that is a very superficial and I would say to some degree shallow degree of comparison for comparison's sake and for making a decision on which one might be the more appropriate one to go with, it's, it's, uh, it's completely just improper and, and non-technical. So, um, you know, but, but it is the one thing as far as a community goes and sort of social engineering, if you will, of um, how can we as closureists adopt category theory such that we're not always identifying it to closure and we can identify the, the benefits in it and extract those and use those and maybe even go all the way where we fully understand the depths of category theory, which is an incredibly deep field unto itself. But when you get to the end of it, you know, you, you now can, can essentially describe and um, it's essentially an assembler language for mathematics. So you can, any operation in math, you now know, you don't always need to be so afraid of it if you can describe it categorically, right? There's a lot of things that are very twisted when you get to the edges of math, mathematics and uh, having a language that can always go back to that, um, I feel is, is very valuable. And of course, what is the point of coding other than to be an autonomous computational calculator for mathematics? Um, you know, I feel like math actually is the ultimate programming language. So um, yeah, so that's really good. So CATS, it does look like is a much more used um, framework. Um, so we should look at that. Um, but yeah, so, so going into this, you know, essentially, so Dragon, I'm sorry, Dragon was the one that helped, that sort of encouraged us to use this as a foundation. I feel like it would be much more useful if he were sort of the one presenting it because to go through this code, like, okay, these are the implementations of uh, these operations. So the ID operation, of course, is the core operator for a monoid. And he knows about what this is doing, and I do not. It is it's essentially, I believe it's the open, open CL implementation for a block vector operation, and he's, he's just initializing it to return zero and we actually don't even use X. So things like this, I'm, I'm, I'm looking at it, trying to sort of reverse engineer it. I'm a little confused. Like, why are we not using X in any way? Uh, 
and it's just returning zero, is that a real, is that a real ID function? Uh, zero is the ID function if you're doing an, if it's an addition operation, but uh, I don't think that's zero is always, um, always that, but it would come down to, of course, what this is doing. So I messed up the code. Uh, so I apologize for that. That uh, decreases the quality a little bit of our presentation. Um, but I still, you know, there's some value in it. So we have four more references to monoid. And again, okay, so, so up here. So, okay, so there it is. All right, cool. Okay, so for the matrix operation, for an OpenCL matrix operation, and this is, okay, when you get to the end of the literature, the sort of more advanced literature for um, Fluokitten, it, it talks about how to, how to extend the protocols, which this, this is doing here, right? Monoid is a protocol and we're extending it with the ID operation. Um, how to extend them for your own types or your own operations or your own, you know, domain area. And, and be able to have that category theory uh, kind of build up. So this is what we're looking at right now. He's implementing the base operations of the monoid protocol for OpenCL. So this is gonna be, I don't know what GE is, but some kind of a matrix operation. So he's returning the identity of a matrix. So basically is column major. Again, we're not using the, I don't know why we're not using the parameter. I'll have to ask him about that. Um, but okay, so this is a uh, CL upload matrix. Upload. Yeah, that is OpenCL. Okay, cool. So these are OpenCL ops. And then, and then of course, so the other, uh, another core operation, especially in coding, I don't see this one a fold and a foldable, like having things be foldable. I've not seen that as much in the mathematical literature. Um, but what I read from the coding standpoint, um, a fold is, is an equal level of an operation to a, a functor or a category or a monad, right? It's, it's something that's, um, that's a, a key concept to, to normalizing, to renormalizing the type identity on an operation. Um, and it looks like then he's just doing the one operation on a foldable here for again, the, the block vector. So um, I think that's the most basic uh, vector implementation in OpenCL. Um, and so then we have kind of these others. So I think these are all gonna be implementations right here. These are gonna be, yeah, CL and CU. Okay, so this is gonna be, so okay, cool. So this is the, so this is the protocol implementation for uh, NVIDIA's CUDA architecture. And this is it for OpenCL architecture, allowing us then to perform these operations on a, a GPU. Um, so now we can do category theory operations directly on GPUs through closure, uh, which is really cool. Um, so we can just take a real quick look at, uh, at this one. Um, so again, here's Flowkitten, the protocols. We'll just look at Monoid, that's the most, uh, kind of our basic operator. Yeah, okay. Interesting. So, okay, yeah. So he has some basic, I don't know where these are coming from, but these are, these are basic GPU level operation implementations. He goes into some C code down here, a little further down, and then some CUDA code for, um, yeah. So here's the CUDA implementations for NVIDIA uh, open uh, uh, GPUs. And here are the uh, OpenCL ones for any other GPU that supports OpenCL. So we're effectively redefining it for that. Um, and then if we go to our, what I'm going to guess will be our implementation, internal host Fluo kitten. Go again for. Okay, cool. So here he's just doing, these are the basic operations. Um, cool, right on. Although I don't see, no, cool. So this is his, okay, right. This is his, uh, we don't have core though. We're not, in, we're not incorporating core. Um, interesting. 
if you wrap that. So the so Flow Kitten, as far as I know, it exposes everything through core. So everything is implemented in sub in these sort of sub uh, modules, if you will, or namespaces, but then wrapped publicly through core is kind of his overall architecture. So we have functors. So this is our yeah okay cool. So he's using protocols. So we go through and we define our protocols with our base operations, um, et cetera, et cetera. So, right, so here we are with the monoid, an ID function, that's it. And it allows us to then do this op, which should be either on, where's op? Yeah, there's op, okay, cool. Okay, right on. So, yeah, I mean, these are like as basic as you can get, right? To to begin using category theory in our code, um, you know, monoid and uh, monad, um, and what was the other one? Uh, ID. Yeah, the monoid. Yeah, monoid and, and uh, yeah, exactly, and magma. Sorry, so, okay. Um, so, but then core, so I was looking, the reason I started looking at this actually was that operator that he has um, that we were looking at. Uh, sorry, this is, it was over here. It was in the CU stuff. No, it was in this flow kit and stuff. Sorry. Yeah, it was here. So he has some basic operations he's doing, and then he's doing this. I don't know if those are flow kitten functions. So I believe that is, I don't think that is a vector. If we have a vector, we're going to get the dimension of X and Y and we're going to do check vector dimensions. I don't think that is a greater than or equal to. I don't think that's what he's doing there. I believe that is coming out of flow kitten, which is why he's referencing that here. And then he has these basic checks. So I wanted to try and find that, the implementation of that. I know it's in core, like it's supposed to be in core. So yeah, there we are. Okay. Okay, cool. These, so that's not the exact one. Maybe that was a closure operation then. Um, but these are, these are his Haskell type. Okay, so back to the question about fun, cool cats versus um, dragon's flow kitten. I really like this part about it. The other thing is I have a lot of Haskell books and I read up on Haskell a lot. And so this gives us the opportunity a little bit to whenever we learn something in Haskell, um, we can apply it uh, nicely in, uh, in Clojure. And perhaps, perhaps FunCool also has that. So those are good, really good questions. Um, do you guys have any questions or thoughts or ideas so far? No? Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, I, I my thought would be maybe to find out what could be an applicable basic, but not too basic operation that we could do uh, in the um, um, category theory. We need to go through it together and then cool. make a comparison between uh, those two. Something that yeah should be not too basic, but also probably not, not, not too hard. Yeah, I agree. For, um, for the beginning. Because, so, of course, you can look at the code, but there is also a lot of theory behind, and you kind of need both to... And, and, and it's with everything you learn, you have to catch up to catch up with the other yes. uh, in order to make no, progress. That's, that's absolutely true. So I'm, I feel like, in a way, I'm abusing the group by doing, by presenting like this. The thing was, I wanted, you know... I started talking to Dragon about um, the best way to present this. And he essentially said, just present the Neanderthal, uh, Neanderthal's utilization of Flow Kitten. And um, it's, it's, I think if he were doing it, it would be totally awesome. This would be like the best presentation ever. So I think we should definitely get him to do that. But um, no, I think that's a good idea. That was essentially my goal for this presentation tonight was essentially uh, bait the interest, gauge the interest, and then bait anyone who might be on the fence. 
and put a group together, a subgroup, a really a, it's a closure group still, but to go through and do, I don't know if you guys are familiar with Stephen Wolfram's physics project. He started it, I think he started it right before COVID started, but with COVID, he kind of took the opportunity to put it into overdrive. And so if you look him up on YouTube, Stephen Wolfram physics project, he's basically, he identified kind of these core data models and it's kind of a little bit like his stuff with the cellular automata. Um, the idea is to, to describe from the beginnings physics using hypergraphs. And that's what I want to do with this is sort of enclosure using category theory present on a semi-regular basis, um, probably core, either some combination of core mathematical operations, because that really is, I feel like when we do apply category theory as programmers, we miss out on a lot of what it has to offer by just doing the structural stuff, which we already have really in, in higher order functions. So I want to drive it with that. And then also architectural dynamics or aspects that are um, made elegant by the application of category theory. So yeah, what do you guys think about that? Yes, it, it seems quite, uh, very interesting because uh, that's the main challenge, or at least in my case, the uh, very tough challenge of category theory to have the, the chance to, to put it into practice in, in a, in a non-trivial way uh, because uh, all the, the most of the the material you find you find out in the internet uh, is mainly uh, tiny exercises which uh, fragmented exercises and you you never uh, <laughs> have the chance to jump into some relevant uh, case studies and, and perhaps the relevant case studies are too uh, complex. So the, 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 the problem is in the, in the jump. Yeah, I fully agree. And, and Neanderthal, uh, having be, been based on, on, on Fluokitten, perhaps seems to be a very interesting uh, case study in order to have a practical context to, get to, to, uh, to have an, uh, an opportunity to, to put a category theory into practice. Yeah, absolutely. Neanderthal is an elegant architecture just in and of itself in the sense like, cool, we're doing, you know, C level and, and CUDA level GPU operations in closure. Like, how badass is that? I mean, you know, it's, it's why Dragon's famous. It's like nobody else has, has made that, has done that yet. So it's totally a cool uh, framework to check out. I, yeah. So, okay, cool. Luis, it sounds like you're totally, you're stoked and you're on board then. Yes. Okay, awesome. And then was it Megan, I think, or Heather, I'm sorry, Heather was also interested in doing, uh, does anyone else? Uh, but, but further, furthermore, you, uh, you have the chance to, to, to enter a very interesting uh, subject uh, such as uh, deep learning. Yeah, the, 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 the domain uh, in itself is uh, very interesting and very attractive from, a, from a, both a, a, an, a, an academic point of view and a, and a professional point of view. Yep, absolutely. I mean, uh, could, you, could you guys uh, maybe help us a little bit, maybe a bit support material or, or list of material? So, for example, if you want to dive into the next subject into the, in the next session if you can maybe publish a uh, few papers or, or books or, or sections that you that you can recommend uh, for what you are doing so then it would be help it, it would probably help to to follow along yeah cool okay that's a great a great suggestion and yeah i think that uh Goes without saying the so new, new uh, concepts and, and stuff. Uh, I really want to know more about it, but uh, probably I need a little bit more time than just a few minutes uh, uh, to go. Category theory is definitely one of those things where it's like you can get in at the shallow end of the pool quite easily, making that transition. And so I'll, I'll put that together for our next meetup. 
um, just kind of a, a more something more structured and something that's written out um, uh, more than a, a, it won't be a slide deck, it'll be a PDF, it'll be a document. Um, one thing I'm trying to, I, I'm, I've struggled with a little bit in, in putting all this together was I currently don't have a, like an editor environment for doing categories. And so I'm like, I'm either need, I either need to write one or find one. Right now, the only way I know to do, to like actually uh, generate the equations myself is to write LaTeX. And it's like, okay, that's kind of fun also. But I mean, I just have really bad memories of physics when I decided to do all my papers in LaTeX and was up to like 5 a.m. coding LaTeX and not learning physics. So, <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I need something easier than LaTeX this time around. Um, but, but yeah, so. Cool, okay. well, yeah, guys, I think, um, I mean, that's kind of the, the bulk of what I had now was sort of the intro and then just um, gauging our interests. And it feels like a lot of people are really interested in this. 40 people actually signed up once they saw the category theory thing. So it was like, that was kind of overwhelming actually. I think if it were to be established and, and recurring, um, and then of course to do it in closure because that's the whole point of it, is to, to have it in a practical language and to a little bit free it from its current, it's almost like if someone came up with object-oriented programming, but they only put it in, the only thing that ever existed for it was, was C++ and nobody else ever did it, it would be like, well, well object-oriented, that's C++. And it's like, oh, wait, no, you can do it in C, you can do it, you can do it in any language, right? Um, it's really just associations and then maintaining a, a pointer to a function call. So, so yeah, okay, um, cool. Thank you very much, you guys, for coming. Yeah, thank you, to, thanks yes, to thank you. you. I do have a question. So this is all very abstract and I would like it to be a little bit more concrete. So suppose I'm very happily coding in pretty typical closure, in what situations will I reach for category theory? Yes, that is, that is a great question. Um, yeah, so that I feel like is, that is definitely the goal of this as a series. And so I, I wanna just um, implement or introduce right now kind of the basic concepts so to me, I've come to, to category theory more mathematically than, uh, than seeing it as a programming discipline. The beauty of it is having this unified, integrated foundational framework to describe the complexity that always is mathematics. I mean, if, even in mathematical papers, right, terms are always redefined at the, at the outset. So it's like what a symbol might have meant in one, one paper doesn't mean the same in another. And so how can you, and that was also the other goal is when I started as going down this path is like to do kind of a, um, a scientific analytics platform that, that, that mines essentially mathematical papers and then, and then automatically implements them in theorem proving systems and tries to identify the validity and, and the potential like uh, cross pollination of throughout papers. And it's like category theory very much allows us, at least in theory, to do that easily um, and get around the problem of this continuous redefinition. So my answer is intrinsically mathematical. However, um, you know, like it is basically what category theory allows you to do is what higher order functions in traditional functional programming languages allow us to do on steroids. Right, so like higher order functions give us these basic building blocks for doing computability and tr integrated with traversability over uh, uh, collections of sequences, right? And so like this basically allows you to take that and just build it to a much, much higher level um, and much more powerful because you can you can abstractify your operations and the types that those that the operations are occurring on. So like right now, if I were to write a map operation in closure, you know, I would in theory, I would need to like reference the specific data types. I might use a set of keywords on a, um, a hash map, right? 
um, or um, I guess we call it a map, the, the, whatever the native type is for the curly braces. Um, and then where we use keywords in that. So I might have to, it, it's, it's extremely like type implementation specific. And then the problem with that even is like you get errors every time, um, even if you change, like I did this once where and I changed my font, my colorization on my IDE simultaneously. So like it took me four or five hours on this mobile app to find out that I freaking misnamed the keyword on the map index. And like, I didn't, yeah, like it took me four hours to debug that. I finally went to the point where I was, every single line of code I put in a print statement, it's like, wait, it's that one right there, oh. But, um, but with, with category theory, you effectively get the opportunity at runtime. I feel like, so I'm going out on a little bit of a ledge here saying this, but effectively what spec gives us. So closure spec, right, is this really sweet foundational like kind of utility platform to describe basically the expected structure of our data. Like what is, what is a common case? What are the outer edges of our data? And then what do the functions look like? What is the expectation of the functions that should look as they look like as they are processing that data? So, or yeah, so like, what does a function take? What does it return? And then there's another keyword on FN. Like this allows you, that again is the same thing, but it's implementation specific. I can't, and it's always, there's always gonna be some like tying it down. Even like um, there's a book on, there's a category theory book, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, this book, um, Categories for Software Engineering. Oh, it might be backwards. So this is a cool book because it's telling you like, um, here is how to define implementation specific categories to describe the dynamics and the, the paradigms present in software engineering. Uh, it's a really cool book, um, but, but, but it's like when you look at it and you look through it, it is more general and therefore more flexible than things like spec and, and then our higher order functions. So it gives us a, a kind of higher kindedness to more generalize our operations. So that would be to me the motivation for using it in code. Um, in math, it's like, uh, there's this quote I love by David Hilbert in this book uh, called Top Away. This is also a really good category theory book. Top Away, the categorical analysis of logic by Robert Goldblatt. Um, and so what they allude to with a quote here at the outset by David Hilbert is, no one shall drive us out of the paradise that Cantor has created, David Hilbert. And so this is the, this is kind of the introduction to this um, in this book. And it's like, so that was in the late 1800s when they were looking at redescribing all of mathematics in set theory. And I feel like we've effectively gotten there with category theory and, and, that, and that paradise that Hilbert's referring to um, this, you know, was initiated with Cantor and was realized with Saunders McLean um, is very much category theory. So there's a, a lot of intrinsic power in the paradigm. So yeah, that's a really good question though. Thank you. All right, cool. So, um, yeah, I hope you guys liked it. That's really all I have for tonight. I bet you it was great getting that haircut. Cool. But you're great getting that haircut. Oh, I'm sorry. What's oh? Does anyone have anything else? Uh, 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 will we go, uh, go on? Uh, will you uh, give us uh, another another presentations? Absolutely, I would love to. I'm really glad to hear of your interest, Luis, and Olaf, and, and the others. Um, yes, I will. Um, you guys are interested in this, so it was something I was hoping to find as a group of people that are interested in the combination of category theory and closure um, to have regular um, kind of presentations, which is very much why, um, you know, for this, this is uh, installment one. So we'll go ahead with that. We'll do installment two. Um, we'll probably keep it out of band of our regular meetings, Jacob. I don't know, you and I can, uh, well, actually, what times would work for everyone? 
And how often would you like to see something? Perhaps once a month. Once a month, okay. Um, is there a day that works best? I know, like... Uh, like today, in, in my case, like today. Uh, 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 Friday, like, 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 like today, uh, would be, it would be great. Oh, cool, okay. In my case, it's just... Uh, interesting. Are you unable to make other days other than Friday? Because a lot of people are turned off by the Friday night thing. I'm really glad. Ah, okay. Guys, yes. Yeah, you guys are like the most dedicated bunch coming to this on a Friday night. <laughs> Everyone else is out doing movies and having a good time and yes, yes, going to parks and no. At, at, at this time uh, here in Argentina, it is it is the evening, so I I will be mostly. Uh, available. Okay, cool. Yeah, I mean, honestly, uh, in uh, Zurich, there is a large uh, closure group as well, and uh, I think I'm the only one joined because it's uh, three o'clock in the morning. Too late. Sprachst du Deutsch, Olaf? Yeah, yeah, sicher. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, yeah, ich war in Berlin für drei Jahre. Um, yeah, there's so much closure over there in Europe, and I totally missed it. Um, so I regret that. But perhaps maybe you, so you have a, there is a closure group over there in Zurich? Yes, definitely. Um, it's uh, unfortunately a little bit inactive for a while uh, regarding uh, uh, um, live meetups, but uh, we have our channel, and from time to time, uh, people still talk to each other and uh, share interest cool no it might be good to to integrate with those guys a little bit also and um being that we're a more international audience now i guess we can try and find a time that uh i i can certainly do this during the noon hour as well so cool i think one thing that might be good too is um maybe rebrand the meetup a little bit because because it's this and a lot of meetups are still kind of geographically branded, which really doesn't make sense anymore. You know, I mean, I mean, kind of like there's a closure data science meetup, right? So it's more like a topic rather than an area, which is meaningless currently. Yes. So, so it might might even, and you might get more participation and better for marketing if if you started up and maybe a new thing and called it like closure category theory meetup. The thing is, it costs like. I don't know. It's about a hundred bucks a month for all of the, like the domain name. Yeah. So right. well, that's, yeah. but I, I agree with you on, on that in, in premise. Um, yes, that's, yeah, that's a good point, Jacob. How unfortunate that we did it right before a pandemic. Hit. But category theory is, is a very attractive uh, subject, not not in the, not mainly in the closure space. In closure space, it's not, not it's, it is not that popular, but in the static typed uh, languages such as Haskell or Scala, uh, Kotlin, uh, even TypeScript, there are several initiatives. Uh, closures perhaps uh, lags behind those other perhaps uh, in, in in those other languages the mindset of the of the people involved uh, are more uh, friendly with a category theory than in, in closure. Perhaps that's the, the difference. But category theory right now is a, is a quite attractive, a, a quite popular uh, subject. It really is, yeah. And it's because it's, I mean, even like, you know, watching um, uh, Stephen Wolfram with his physics project, he considered very briefly category theory as a way of trying to re-describe physics in one, in, a, in one integrated language and one that's temporally uh, kind of aligned, if you will. Um, so, but, but it's a language that has that kind of power, right? It's, it's, a, it's, it's a, an algebraic assembler for concepts and relations and transformations. So that's why I want to do it in Clojure actually is because I think I would like to try and stick with Clojure and have it be a part of a Clojure group. It's okay if we bring in other languages, of course, but um, category theory is, is very much at risk in the programming community. 
of being indefinitely bound entirely to Haskell and perhaps unbindable. You know? Yes. It's like we have one language. If it were 1980, only C++ did classes and OOP and and now and nobody and everybody else stayed function uh, procedural. That's that's kind of the case as it sits right now. And so part of my goal is to one to explore the topic with a with a group of interested people, but also to free category theory from Haskell. I love Haskell. <laughs> I love it. Yes, 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 yes. It's my favorite language by far. Um, but I don't like the idea that we've made the mistake socially as a as a you know from a programmer kind of perspective like it's bound right now it lives very much with that language yes and it's frustrating because when you go to program when you go to functional programmer circles who are i mean like i don't mean to be a snob but usually the smartest among the most intelligent and the most well read among programmers and then you find them saying oh no that's haskell and like no it's not haskell come on it's not haskell <laughs> There's, but, but, but perhaps perhaps Haskell is is a more more complete in the in the functional programming paradigm because exactly as it supplies you with a category theory out of the box and and oh, it is a complete out of out of the box oh out of the box okay with the language itself. Uh, and in the Lisp uh, dialects do not. Uh, so perhaps uh, this initiative uh, is uh, filling that gap. So that is the other side of it. The, the, okay, that is the countervailing current, I feel, is that the Lisp, the Lispy way of doing things, or the Lisp power, if you will, its magical sword that it wields, is the macro, the power of the macro. Yes, yes. Right? Not that is the but then but we're a lisper, so we follow the fight club rule, right? Like the first rule about macros is don't ever write a macro. But <laughs> but a uh, closure is is this is different in that in that uh, aspect because it is uh, perhaps among the the least dialect, it is the one which pays less attention to macros in and, and more attention to data structures uh, <laughs> and. Okay. And uh, perhaps uh, huh. and, uh, uh, functional programming uh, it has the advantage over the metaprogramming typical from this dialect uh, uh, of, uh, uh, of the combinator, combinator uh, the, the, the kind of combinations, you, natural combinations you, you are able to, to fulfill with uh, with the category theory and functional program much uh, perhaps uh, m uh, stronger than the the the, the, the macros are uh, are not so composable uh, as functions so yeah. the, perhaps that's the 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 the, the, point, the that's advantage of 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 that I feel the 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 the, the husk and so on yeah that's, and the that's, macros are more more difficult to compose yeah no well they're uncomposable fundamentally because you don't have yes. the the algebraic uh rule set of the the category theory gives you yes you know so that's that's interesting and, that's really interesting. and combining combining them all perhaps it seems quite attractive in the, exactly in, the, right. in the in the case of of, of, of category theory over over at least dialect right it's it's not one or the other why not have the best of both worlds yes you know so and, and furthermore furthermore a, a lisp a, a, is a list dialect enclosure in particular is is a, more comfortable to work on work, work with with the the, the for instance, in my case, I, I like to, to, to code closure on Emacs, oh, Emacs. Cool, yeah. And, yeah. And, and once you have the, 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 the developer environment fully set up, it is surprisingly comfortable to, to code over Emacs and, and, and at least dialect. And mm -hmm. uh, on the other hand, coding in Haskell it is a nightmare from the from the 
a developed environment point of view. Yeah, it, it, is, I, it is very, very, very uh, uh, clunky, uh, very uh, difficult to, to set up and so on. Yeah, when oh, I started, okay. uh, uh, when I really started off with Clojure, I, 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 I really focused on just uh, learning the language first. But then after one, uh, two months, I figured something was like really difficult with the IDE I was using and I switched to Emacs, unfortunately. But maybe also fortunately that put me a little bit back on my advancement on Clojure, but I'm so happy that I did it. The combination is so fun, so fun. Wow. Yes, 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 yes. It, it, is, it is difficult to get set up, but once you, and, and, and having the click in your mind, but once you, you got the click, it is, uh, it is uh, astonishing. Cool. Jacob, and having, I, having all, of the, all of those parts uh, together seems uh, very powerful and very comfortable. Yeah. I started out in Emacs actually doing C and C++, but like, I mean, that was in the, in the late 90s and early 2000s. And then I, when I came to Clojure, I was like, oh, I should do this. And I fired it up and it was like, ah, oh, no, like, there's no way. I don't want to go back to this. Like, yes. 1974. But but, but uh, with, with Lisp, uh, with any Lisp dialect, Emacs is uh, very, very strong. Because okay, yeah. you, you jump all the time with, with, the, with the shortcuts and uh, you, you are able to uh, evaluate expressions on the, on the code itself and, uh, uh, and combine the REPL with the, with the development environment uh, quite, very naturally. And once you you get the the, the click, uh, it is uh, it yeah, is astonishing. Would you, would you be willing to do a presentation to our group on your uh, development environment setup? Oh, we're great. Yeah, we talked about doing that a while ago on just the different closure environments and like the kind of the levels of productivity that you can gain from them. I feel like in a way. Like that's one of the killer apps of Clojure is like, if you look at all the innovation in dev environments, you look at like, um, I think his name's Bruce Howman and stuff like that. There's a lot of people doing super smart stuff as far as yes. the developer pipeline, you know, the SDLC cycle, and yes. especially for the, the individual developers compile deploy thing. For me, I'm so impatient. I'm like, once I have to sit there and, run five commands in a row to get it set up. I'm just like, ah, no, when I go back to Visual Studio. And, and, that, and that's combined with, the, with the perhaps four or five frameworks in the, in the closure space, which are the state, state, stateful managers, perhaps the, the, more, the, the most uh, uh, popular are right now uh, Mount, and uh, another one is a uh, integrant and another one is a, uh, I don't remember there, they are three, which are, you are able to uh, uh, refresh the state of the, of the application on the REPL with a single, with a single comma. So uh, you, uh, you uh, never has to uh, restart your application. You you have never to restart the the REPL, which in closure takes some time. So you instead of restarting your REPL, you refresh your application in the same REPL session. So you are always the 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 development loop is quite quite quite. Uh, uh, Quite agile, quite agile, and you you are always on the loop. It is uh, very astonishing. Cool. Okay, I just sent you an IM uh, to yeah. Send me your email and let's let's see let's work something out to get that set up. I think there's yes. a lot of people like me who, in fact, I know there are that I've worked with actually, where it's like we want to go down these paths of setting these really wonderful uh, development environments up. 
but then we just end up not having the the patience for it so that would yes be, if you could uh, yeah, that's, that's, that's the one, challenge that's yeah, the challenge one, one one tip uh, how i managed to, to do it uh, i forced myself uh, using uh, emacs doing yes. work for yeah. other stuff i i did all my terraform and python i started to do it in emacs and of course it slowed me down uh, at the beginning but uh, that way uh, i started to to get uh, efficient over time and uh, it, it became more and more fun and now i wouldn't go back anymore but uh, but uh, the 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 most uh, the, the, where you you take take out most of the usefulness of, of Emacs is in the combination with the least dialect. Cool. Okay. It, 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 that, there you have the most synergy yeah. between all the parts. Awesome. Well, let's get that set up. That would be so great to have you show us just how you've set your environment up, kind of this from start to ready to code, and then maybe some tricks, some coding tricks in it. I, I, I'm, I am a beginner. Uh, <laughs> please oh. take it, it into account. But I, I, I explore all of this just in my spare time, so I don't have the chance to 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 reach critical mass. The, 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 but uh, uh, perhaps uh, uh, yes, yeah, I, I could be able to 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 show it to to all of you. Okay. Yeah, that would be great. Okay, cool guys. Well, um, yeah, if, uh, if anyone has any parting thoughts, I think maybe we can call it a night at that. Sounds good. Thanks everyone for yes, coming. Yes, yes. All right, guys. Have a great one. And yeah, thanks again. The same to you. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. See you all.